famous notification there we go clicking it away welcome one and all lovely that you are joining us today um maybe I'll, I'll kind of do a couple of starts as we as we get going and in a and in a few moments i'll kind of like properly uh, properly leap into this um you know what does it mean to be a people who trace our ancestry back a long time you know we're tremendously proud of it and um, we sometimes associate to it miraculous stuff you know that's to say oh we you know we must be you know kind of right because otherwise we wouldn't still be here or we might sometimes sort of associate some of the miracles that are explicit particularly in the biblical period you know wow you know god brought us out of the land of egypt promised to bring us to the promised land and brought us to the promised land and made the promise of the promised land that we kind of walk around with a a sense of pride in our history and that's all good but those kinds of relationships to our history are theological or to share a sort of another word a word i like very much mythic right they are they are ways of holding information that move us rather than the kind of blunt sort of self exposure to reality um you know and we're all aware of the relationship between those two things and in fact of course new london synagogue um you know delighted to have some people from across the movement joining us this evening but the very essence of new london synagogue is that we care about what really happened and if what really happened as explained or as suggested by an inquiry into the historistic record kind of shakes our mythic sense of who we are then we need to kind of like own that and, and and perhaps to some extent adjust the myth make sure that the stories that we tell ourselves bear a relationship to you know historicism so let me just say you know word what is what does historistic mean historistic means stuff what really happened as opposed to history which is the stories that we tell about what really happened which may or may not be kind of um, you know, like, you know, what language do we use? You know, I mean, I, I remember doing, I remember doing my, my history study in America where the fact that something was in the New York Times meant that it happened. And now, of course, we live in a world where, you know, like, what new source do you go to? So, you know, we're very aware, I think, of challenges of history. All right, that's enough, enough chat. We have a long period to get through today. Um, today, I'm going to be having a go at the biblical period. Um, I, I've taught this in the past, and I've I've used the term from one to one. Uh, let me just click some slide. This and this I want to go slideshow. Start from the very beginning. Ah, uh -huh. right. I'm looking at from one to one, but I'm changing my method of counting. I'll say more about this in a moment. And um, we think of ourselves religiously as living in the year five, seven, eight two so i'm one is the beginning of creation um but when i say the second one i'm thinking of one of what i would refer to as the common era what my christian friends refer to as one ad anno domini um and uh, that's our kind of our journey for today what i want to do now i will do if i can work out there we go um is just give you a quick sense of chronology um, for the entire period, and then I'm going to drop in and we'll spend most of our time looking at sort of little moments that I think are kind of interesting to think about as we engage with this question about what do we do with the biblical We've lost you, Jeremy. It's, have you gone on to mute accidentally? Yeah, somebody muted me. Maybe it was me. I know what happened. I just pulled my little picture to the side. Thank you, Louis. Um, I pulled my little picture to the side so that I could see what I've got here on um, uh, on, on our screen. All right. So um, what you're looking at is a chronological table. And the second column across is the Hebrew date. And according to the Hebrew date, zero is a you know, bit of argument about what it actually captures. But go with me that the expulsion from the garden will do as our zero. And therefore, you've got people like Abraham kind of, you know, around in the Hebrew year 2060. 
and the exodus from Egypt and the 40 years of wandering in the desert, which brings us up to the end of the Chumash, of the first five books, the T of, T of Tanakh or the Torah, is round about 2265 on this kind of count, which is going to, again, bring us up to five, uh, 5782. By the time you get into Hebrew years like 2760, you're starting to think about names that we would recognize Saul, David, Solomon. And that, of course, is at the time of the construction and the, the, the kind of the existence of the first temple. Just rolling through so that we will can, can kind of hang on, still not quite sure. There we go. Just to sort of finish off um, where we're going to get to, I'm going to say quite a bit about the siege of Lachish um, later on in this session. And the siege of Lachish is in the secular calendar or the secular numbering system of BCE. So you've got, um, or BC as the Christians would call it, of 700, 701, um, where it's sort of uh, Hebraically, whoops, um, I don't know, you know, uh, 2400. And then the, you get the destruction of the northern kingdoms. So, you know, the children of Israel leave, leave Egypt, they arrive in the promised land, they kick everybody else out, they build a temple, it goes quite well until, you know, it doesn't. And eventually the northern kingdoms get dispersed by that's by um, a king. Again, all of this is inside um, the biblical um, narrative period, or, you know, you, you, you can read about this kind of stuff in books of Isaiah, Jeremiah. And eventually in, and this is, if you were to choose two numbers to learn um, in Jewish history, and I'm not very good at learning numbers, the two numbers that are worth learning are minus 586, what happened in minus 586, the first temple was destroyed and the children of Israel went into Babylon and there we wept and we remembered Zion. Um, so that's sort of, you know, 3000 years worth of stuff from creation of the world up to the destruction of the first temple. And some time later, Cyrus allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and they build the second temple, you know, hurrah, hurrah. And you get the latest, the most kind of chronologically modern of the prophets that we have, people like Haggai and Zechariah. You get um, things like the books of um, Ezra and Nehemiah. And this starts to get to the end of the, um, you know, the biblical period. So um, I, I, the most uh, modern historical events that we know about that are recorded in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, all of that concludes in the Hebrew year, round about 3302. And, and this is just the relationship between the uh, second column across and the first column across, that's about 450 years BCE, before the Common Era, or BC as the Christians would call it. Um, just one thing here, it's, it, you know, again, the second number that might be worth remembering today is 3760. So between January and Rosh Hashanah, if you want to know the relationship between the secular year and the Hebrew year, so 2022 or 5782, they are 3760 years apart. It goes off after, after Rosh Hashanah, but, you know, that's just to kind of um, cohere us. Let me pause. Um, I'm not able to see everybody on my little screen. So if you have questions, thoughts, you can stick them in the chat and I'll catch them um, or uh, possibly interrupt me. But I, I might mute you if you interrupt me too often. Sorry, it's a, a presenter's power that I will be uh, perhaps having to wield. All right, let's just try and catch that again, just in case we're not interested in Judaism. In other words, if we weren't kind of obsessed about who we are as Jews and we were just thinking about the world or the ancient Near East more broadly or the cradle of civilization, which was ancient Mesopotamia, the ancient Near East, what are the sorts of things that we would be kind of aware of? So what I'm going to look now at is my third column, the Jewish history and the fourth column, the secular history. And it's just important because I'm going to talk a little bit later about the Code of Hammurabi. So, you know, just 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 hold who Hammurabi was, or more particularly, when Hammurabi was alive. So Hammurabi is a king of the, um, the, the Amorites. He writes a legal code. We're going to look at that in a few moments. But note that Hammurabi 
was alive in round about the same kind of period that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were around, not Sinai, right? So Hammurabi precedes Sinai. You need to sort of hold that. Um, you know, there is indeed a whole bunch of building that goes on in Egypt round about the time that the Bible tells us that the children of Israel were in Egypt. And interestingly, there is something that we're going to meet a little bit later called the Menepta Stele. Um, and I will talk about that later, but we can date the Menepta Stele very, very accurately because it, you know, it has a date that we can kind of check with a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, minus 1209. I'm going to come back to talk about that in a moment, but like it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a historical record. You will see it um, today. Um, it's a historical record of the period after the children of Israel leave Egypt as they are starting to come into the land. We'll get back to that later. Second Iron Age, for those of us who are interested in things like the Second Iron Age, um, you know, and indeed the Babylonian Empire do come through and conquer um, everything, but in turn get conquered themselves, and you start to see the rise of the Roman Empire, and that's just sort of just checking us in there on that sort of broad sweep of chronology, which I've now kind of, as it were, told twice. Once from inside the Torah, and once by paying attention to outside the Torah. And that's kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to throw the external to the Torah account of history against the internal to the Torah account of the story. You know, is that history? Is that historicity? And we're going to see what happens and what happens at different places as we go through the narrative. That is, you know, how long have I got left? I've got 50 minutes left. That's what I'm going to be, um, you know, doing doing today. Let me just pause. Any questions, any comments, anything that's uh, on anybody's mind? Hurrah, excellent. This is one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen. Um, you know, if you've ever been to Berlin and you've been to the Pergamon Museum, you will know it. If you haven't been to Berlin and you haven't been to the Pergamon Museum, go. Um, I, I'm sorry for the quality of the picture, but what you are looking at is jaw dropping. It is a huge, bright blue, incredibly entrant, ancient gateway. It's called the Ishtar Gate. It's a, a gate linked to the Mesopotamian goddess of love and war. Um, and it marks the entrance into the inner city of Babylon during the time of Nebuchadnezzar II. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, we know he's a figure that, that exists in the Torah, but he's quite late. He's about minus 600 in the biblical period. So he's round about sort of here at the time of the destruction of the northern kingdoms. While Israel is not doing very well militarily, historic, historically, we're not very powerful in this period. Other people are doing well and they're building big stuff. How big, I hear you ask? Enormous. The Ishtar Gate is at one of the gates, it's the West Gate, it's sort of over here, the Temple of Marduk in Babylon. And at the center of the Temple of Marduk in Babylon is this sort of ziggurat, is this tower. Um, you can see um, just how exquisitely it was. I mean, you know, again, we'll kind of catch some of the um, colonialization of archaeology as we tell this story, because you'll notice that this extraordinary it's in Berlin, it's in Germany, excavated over um, 18 years at the back end of the um, 19th century, 1899 to 1917, by a German archaeological team, um, and they brought it to Berlin. And so the inner gate is 25 metres off the ground from the roadway to the top of its towers. Um, and the passageway that connects the entrance into the city of Babylon into this courtyard is 48 meters. So there are these sort of like double gates creating this huge pathway. This is enormous. Can you imagine wandering around you near know, the ancient Near East and just sort of literally bumping into this and going, ah, oh, yes, um, city of Babylon, pleasure to see you. I'm going to take this whole thing back with me and present it back to Germany. So this is a, you know, one of the great archaeological discoveries of all time and the thing that happens inside my mind when i look at this story 
which is a it is proof positive of a massive great big tower being built in Babylon, part of a kind of like a narrative of other nations being incredibly strong. Is it feels to me, it seems to me that this is somehow wrapped up in the story of how we have a Tower of Babel in our Tanakh, right? It's not, you know, a tower whose uh, top reached it through to the clouds. It's not the origin of the multiplicity of languages that exist in the world, but it is a big tower that you can imagine that as the Torah is coming into being, people would have known about big towers. People would have been aware of different nationalities emerging from major construction sites that exist in the ancient Near East. And that if you were to tell the story of the primordial organization of culture and history in the world, in your mind, you would have big towers. Point that I'm making is this. You can't look at the Torah when it's discussing something as old as the Tower of Babel and say, aha, this is the town. But you can look at the historical record, you can look at the archaeology, you can look at stuff that's coming out of the ground, particularly this incredibly fertile time of, you know, let me use the kind of language that gets used by um, the decolonialists, you know, the rape of the archaeological heritage of the ancient Near East by these colonial masters who brought it all back to Louvre, the British Library, the Pergamon, you know, some of these great kind of collections um that, that we know of and feel that the torah is rooted in a real culture in a real society and in a real history that is my where am i going yeah that's my kind of part one so just you know when you go back to the earliest parts of the bible there is nothing in the historical record that you can find Sorry, we have found yet. I mean, who knows, right? We haven't found any archaeological evidence of where the Tower of Babel was. We haven't found any archaeological um, evidence that there was a particular cave in um, Hebron, the cave of Machpelah that Abraham bought off, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the sort of the Hittites of its time. But there's lots of stuff that is kind of close-ish. There's lots of stuff that makes us feel that there is a certain kind of rootedness in ancient times. That's my kind of, you know, my first little piece, you know, looking at what is there that you can and you can't see in ancient times. Oh, this is good. We're doing we're doing pretty well for time. Uh, I thought this would take me longer to get through. That's my kind of as it were, my first chapter. My second chapter is the Code of Hammurabi. So again, and that, that's why I just wanted to start with this kind of chronology. That, the, that Hammurabi was a real person who was really alive. This is what he looks at. Here he is sat on his throne being, um, you know, addressed by some kind of sort of civil servant. And he has the this sort of rod of leadership in his hand. And he was an incredibly powerful and an interesting person who really did exist. When did he exist? Minus 1726, a patriarchal period, the kind of time that as Jews, I think of as being about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. What is this thing, this steely um, that, that bears his name? Um, it is a, uh, I, I knew, I mean, I've stood next to it. It's about 10 feet tall. I'm not, maybe not 10 feet tall, it's about eight feet tall. It's, oh, sorry, 2.2 meters high. Yes, eight feet tall. Um, and it's it, it's polished, it's exquisite, right? And the Code of Hammurabi, discovered in 1901, again, exactly the same um, period. And the, this one had got taken back to France, right? So when you see this one, you see this one in a vast relief of, um, you know, a picture of Hammurabi himself, is you have a legal code. It's the oldest legal code of its type that we have ever discovered. It is the oldest example of a whole bunch of things that we today take very, very seriously as part of what any legal code ought to do. For example, the presumption that you are innocent until proven guilty can be traced back to Hammurabi's code. Here is a remarkable thing. It's also, um, it's called apodictic. 
it frequently says if such and such happens then the thing to do is such and such so it has a sort of a particular kind of style to it and one of the things that happened and you know if you've never heard um Irving Finkel talk about how we managed to decode um Akkadian you know and all these other ancient languages written in this extraordinary um script cuneiform script I mean it's one of the great he's one of the great storytellers of of of, of our time you know do read the book or watch you know watch the videos or, or you know if you can get to see him in person um we as it began to be translated there was this extraordinary excitement because things that were in the code of Hammurabi which again predates Moses right it's the period of the patriarchs not the period of Sinai are, are already there in the code of Hammurabi. So what I want to do is have a look at an extract from the Code of Hammurabi and compare it, you know, what a week to be teaching such material. Perhaps we should have started last week, which really was the week of us reading, as it were, uh, liturgically, ritually, Mishpatim, Exodus chapter 21. Um, but here we have the Code of Hammurabi, if a man put the eye of another man, put out the, the eye of another man, his eye should be put out. If he breaks another man's bone, his bone should be broken. Oh, it, you, know, you know, just looking across onto the right hand column, Exodus chapter 21, verse 23, 24, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, burning for burning, wound for a wound, bruise for bruise. Oh, hello. That sounds kind of familiar. It might be more poetically expressed. It might be more completely expressed in the Torah. But what we, you know, what you know, the technical term for this is lex talionis, um, a tally, a weight, right? You know, weight for weight, and you know, uh, uh, impossible to not have uh, Shakespeare um, and the Merchant of Venice pop up in my mind at this point. But nonetheless, here's Hammurabi one nine eight second uh, second sort of paragraph here. If somebody puts out the eye of a freed man or breaks the bone of a freed man, he pays one gold mina. If he puts out the, the eye of a man's slave or breaks the bone of the man's slave, you pay one half the value. Interesting. So this sets up within the world of Hammurabi, and you know you can call it um, uh, offensive, or you know just acknowledge that we have moved on from here, or perhaps think that we haven't moved on from here. This sort of um, qualitative uh, um, uh, way of thinking about damage to a free person in contradistinction to damage for a slave. But you have something in the Torah, but it's different. Look how the language comes out in the Torah. If a man strikes the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, well, it's, it's following on from verse 25. So like the idea that having set up your lex talionis, you then discuss what happens if you damage a person's slave, even the relationship between one verse and the next verse feels to be in dialogue. Let me look, you know, I mean, you know, it's drawn from the existence of the Code of Hammurabi in the same place. If you strike the eye of a servant or the eye of his maid and destroy it, you have to let the servant go free. Now, this is a very different idea. It's an idea that talks about the dignity of a human being who cannot be treated as a chuck. You feel that in the Torah? If you damage someone's slave, Hammurabi thought, well, you know, you have to pay, but a slave is a less important person than a, than a free person. So if you do a damage to a free person, you pay one. If you do a damage to a slave, you pay a half. The Torah takes the relationship between eye for an eye that changes the outcome gives it a kind of a tweak and now that i know how hammurabi felt about damages to slaves i can truly understand something about the torah's mindset the torah's attitude towards human beings who are servants or maids which is that if you do damage your servant or maid that's it like this person cannot be allowed to maintain an existence as a servant or a slave, they have to go free. Um, you know, and those of you who heard Rabbi Natasha on Friday night um, talk about uh, letting slaves go free or to, heard me on Saturday morning, I was, you know, also on similar territory. Well, no, you know, and if you know anything about Judaism at all, you know that we carry this understanding of the servant. But here, and this is the key point for me, the, 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 the reason to be excited by the history that we have dug out of the ground when it comes to the Code of Hammurabi, is that it has enriched 
my understanding of Mishpatim. Like once you know the code of Hammurabi, can you imagine the excitement of being the first person and all the people who did this work, they all knew their biblical law absolutely inside out. That as you make your way through the code of Hammurabi, decoding this for the first time, since these languages of Akkadian disappeared from common use and the, the stone got buried, you know, can you imagine the excitement of feeling this dance and all of a sudden, you know, realizing what you have and what you haven't found out? Um, you know, and, 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 and on it goes, if I got one more of these, no, I'm moving on to the next thing. Um, so, you know, what was I saying when I, I was looking at towers? When you go very early, you can't find anything literal. You can just find realias. You can find sort of like a, a sense of, of a story that began in time. When you start looking, a little bit later in historistic time, you bump into the dominant figure of Hammurabi and specifically this extraordinary block of diorite stone. And when you have this diorite stone, as it were, in your hands, when you have it uncoded, you realize that chunks of particularly the legal code of the Torah are coming from somewhere. And I think carrying the history next to your Torah and allowing them to echo off one another. This doesn't in any way decrease my love of the Torah as a legal code. I don't think it's invented ex nihilo. I think that it's drawing on the legal principles of the time and doing, frankly, what I think we do as Jews to this day, filtering through them, saying, yes, this idea, this is right. And this is who I want to be as a Jew. This idea, yeah, I can see, like, you know, I can see we need to kind of cover this in order to create a legal code, but I don't want to cover it in the way that those non Jews covered it, because the non Jews are covering it from a perspective that I, as a Jew, don't want to accept. So I'm going to kind of flip that idea, but it's not that it, it, it's, it's genius or it, it's, it's Kiddush, it's newness is expressed through the understanding of the historistic period. Um, and that's, that's what Hammurabi brings us. And that's what, you know, a lot of ancient Near East um, lexicographically based archaeology brings us. We can find and we have dug out of the earth a whole bunch of stuff on legal matters, as well as some stuff on stories that kind of allow us to see how Jews have told our own story in dialogue with what was being told at the time and earlier, but by giving it certain spins in certain directions. And I think that's a very, very rich thing to um to 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 feel um and to understand pausing for breath pausing for questions how we doing just say we move quite quickly all right maybe not quickly enough you know, this is my next kind of historical uh artifact this is the Menepta Steely um, if you want to see the Manetta Steely, you have to go to Cairo. This one stayed in Cairo, but who discovered it? Good old Flinders Petrie. Who was Flinders Petrie? Well, if you want to see what he did with his life, you have to go to the Petrie Museum. There's the clue, which is the Egyptological collection of the University of London, the University College London. It's, it's fantastic, by the way. I completely recommend it. It's a complete blast. And he went out to Egypt and basically just brought back everything he could lay his hands on. And I'm not entirely sure why he didn't bring back the Manepta Steely, why it is still in Cairo. I'm quite glad it is. But here it is. This is what the great Flinders Petrie, right, 1896. Again, just what a period of time to be involved in this kind of stuff. Um, and he has discovered a narrative of the pharaonic, the, of the Egyptian king who succeeded Ramesses II in minus 1200, uh, reigned from uh, 1213 to 1203. Let me just sort of nip up here, uh, minus 1200. Well, you know, right around this kind of period of time here, right? There is stuff being built in Egypt. Children of Israel are in Egypt. What does it say on this stealing? It's just, I mean, you know, again, like it's, it's, it's staggering that people can manage to decipher this kind of stuff. Like, you know, you go to the British Museum and you see the Rosetta Stone and you go, oh, I see. They took the A with the B and the C, but like, just like unbelievable uh, academic achievements 
but they deciphered it. And it says this, Canaan is captive with all woe. The city of Ashkelon is conquered. The city of Gezer seized. The city of Yenoam made non-existent. Israel is wasted, bare of seed. I mean, you dug out of the ground from the period, a genuine historicity, it's like finding an, you know, an ancient copy of the times. A couple of things that are interesting to say about this. One is, you know, hello Egypt, right? You know, still here, still vibrant, still kicking, you know, and still, you know, um, seedy. Uh, the, the second thing to say about it, and you know, like I'm, I'm just working off academic work here, which is Canaan is, is you know, I don't know, maybe a people or maybe a land, but look, there is a city which is Ashkelon, and a city which is Gezer, and a city which is Yenoam, but Israel is not denoted as a place. It's not denoted as a, a Medina. It is talked about, and the, in my understanding, is the hieroglyphic uh, language, epigraphy that is being used, is of a people sans state. I mean, how extraordinary is that? Like, you know, the, the children of Israel in our very, I'm sorry, I should just say, there are four mentions of Israel that have emerged in the archaeological records outside of the Torah, right? I mean, you know, you know, I mean the Torah, like I don't have an, I don't have a 3000 year old Torah scroll, but I have four things, right? There's one in Cairo, there's one in the Louvre, there's one in, um, in, in Israel, and there's one in the British Museum, you know, and again, you, like we should go and see it. Um, we'll, we'll do we'll do a trip to the British Museum and, and have a look at this. But what's interesting about it is it says that we're dead and we're, you know, we're clearly not. Um, but this is the oldest of them. The very first mention of Israel. Um, I'm aware that we're streaming, you know, Malcolm Vivian, but like, you know, some of the things that you were saying before that were not being streamed, like Jew, people have said about Jews forever. You know, oh, it's a mess. You know, oh, it's so terrible. You know, oh, this went wrong. And the answer is, you know, like, here we are. You know, maybe there is something to this miraculous nature of Judaism after all, but it's just extraordinary to see at that kind of age. And here is something I've taught some of this material before. I've never taught this before. And I just think this is, you know, astounding because in the period that Manepta was around, Egyptians built big things and told stories on them. And if you go to Karna, if you go to the Hypostyle Hall in Karnak, and my goodness, you know, again, let's just kind of salute the magnificence of these ancient structures, you know, built with bits of wood of scaffold. I mean, it is astounding that this stuff got built. Um, you know, I speak as somebody who's, you know, a project to sort of, you know, move a wall and, uh, you know, relocate a staircase took nine months, you know. But um, they, they, they went to this huge hall and successive kings took successive walls and told their story on one of the walls. That's fascinating. And the more famous you were, the more things you did in your life, the more, um, I mean, like, like um, the, oh uh, gosh, what's it, 1066, the, 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 the tapestry, buy a tapestry, the more stuff that you would take. But these guys did it in stone. And what happened to, you know, uh, good old King Manepta is that there was clearly a revolution launched against him. Launched against him by who? Some Canaanites, Ashkelon, Gezer, Yenoam, and it seems a bunch of Israelites. And what did Manepta do? He turned around and he defeated them. And he then went and did the thing that he was supposed to do as a good Egyptian king, as a good pharaoh, by telling the story of what he did in pictures. Now, I tr I've tried really hard to get better pictures of this, and, and I'm afraid this is as good as I can do. This is Manepta's area in the Hypostyle Hall in Karnak. And here is, bottom left-hand corner, there is a, a bunch of Egyptian soldiers who are besieging Ashkelon, and underneath there is an inscription which says, I, you know, I haven't got exactly the word, you know, my people just out to destroy Ashkelon. This is what it looked like on his scarf, right? You know, so we've got a genuine picture of one half, of one quarter of this sentence, right? The destruction of Ashkelon. And we also then have some other stuff. 
And there's another bit in the same area, it's not labeled. But people assume that it's one of these labels. And there's another bit, which again is not labeled. And people assume it's another bit. And then at the top, there's this. And this is, you know, this is from an academic article. It's the University of Memphis, who they have this whole um, uh, Karnak project, a hypostyle hall project. They're trying to take proper photographs and document everything, and it, it's just not all quite there yet, but I'm looking forward to it being there, right? The earliest representation of the Israelites, question? Only the lower third of a scene showing Pharaoh attacking a group of Canaanites survives properly, right? That's, that's one bit that we do have. But the name of these people who were in a similar part of the wall, who some think of Israelites, would have been recorded at the top of this poorly preserved relief, but we've lost the top. I mean, actually, I heard a podcast on this. There's a really interesting podcast called I mean, The Biblical World. Um, and they got one of these academics around to, do, to chat about it. And they said they think that the, the, the stone that would have been on top of this ridge, which might have the name Israel and the faces, right? You know, you can see, we get to see the bottom half of these people. Um, it's in front of the stone that we're looking at. In other words, if I was sort of uh, there looking at that stone, I might be standing on top of the buried stone that fell off, but the Egyptians don't want people lifting stones out from this wall because it's survived for 3000 years and they don't want anybody messing around nearby it. So they're gonna try and see if they can find some other way of sort of seeing if this stone is underneath because it seems like a reasonable supposition to expect that together with Ashkelon and Canaan and Yenoam and you know the, the, and Geza, there is actually something that says, this is Israel and we would therefore be looking at the earliest pictures that we have of Jews, extraordinary. But we don't quite have it. Um, you know, and that should lead, that does lead academics to be much, much more careful. Let me take you through what are effectively two academic positions, one of which is maximalist and one of it which is minimalist. And these are both in an article that was in uh, some education review 2018. Now this is this is pretty this is pretty contemporary stuff. Maximalist, uh, maximalist uh, historians and archaeologists have what they call a high chronology. They think that in the 10th century BCE, at the time of David, you can already dig stuff out the ground that will tell you things that are biblical. 10th century. And the minimalists have what's called a low chronology. They think that the Torah cannot be relied upon until much later, until the ninth, the eighth century BCE. So basically, there is an argument going on between maximalist historians and minimalist historians over about a hundred year, 150 year period, where the maximalists think that they've discovered stuff that is genuinely echoing what's going on in the Torah from just before the creation of the first temple. And the minimalists think that they you can only find in the historical record things just after the time of the creation of the first temple. Let me just take you inside some of this kinds of conversation. In 2008, Yossi Garfinkel, professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I'm going to suggest that it's significant, right? We're going to see an argument between the academics of the University of Jerusalem. What do you know about Jerusalem? And the academics that you know of the University of Tel Aviv. What do you know about Tel Aviv? It shouldn't be too surprising to know that the Jerusalem academics are going to be maximalist and the Tel Aviv academics are going to be minimalist. So he digs out this pot shard in Kirbet Kifia. Uh, Kayafa, inscribed with an ancient Hebrew characters dated to the 10th century. He also finds a highly unusual second gate in heavily fortified city walls, and the combination led him to identify the location as Sharayim, a city mentioned three times in the Bible. Now, why might you think that a city that has two, un two gates, one gate behind another gate, rather unusual, never seen this before, is Sharayim, well, largely because Sharia means double gate. And in early May, Garfinkel announced three large shrines, standing stones, altars, and other cultic objects, including two portable model shrines made of pottery and stone. Garfinkel said that his discoveries prove 
that those who deny the biblical tradition regarding King David and argue that he was a mythological figure or just the leader of a small tribe are now shown to be wrong. What, what, what's, he, what's he just said? He said, here is Sharai. The thing that the Torah itself, like Samuel, the, 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 the Navi element, the early Navi element of the Torah, the thing that that describes when it says there was a proper king, King David, and he had a proper uh, Medina, a proper state, I have found archaeological evidence for this city, this town, Sharaim, that it was a proper town. It was properly set up and it was D Davidic. Um, and I have found evidence of this. What's the evidence that he's found that leads him to think that this really was King David's um, city, Sharaim? There's a double gate and there's a bunch of other stuff. But you can see that it doesn't actually say David was here. You know, we haven't found a coin with a picture of David's head on it. You know, like, you know, like we're, we're struggling. But you know, that's a maximalist position. When you found something that echoes the biblical period, maximalists are more likely to think that this is indeed the biblical period. Meanwhile, you know, far off, far away in Tel Aviv, and of course, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv are separated by much, much more than the short motorway that separates them as a matter of geography, right? They're coming from two very, very different places. And the University of Tel Aviv is coming from a very, very different place from the more kind of religiously infused notion that we have of Jerusalem. I know bar is a religious university. I'm not trying to make that kind of a point. But it is interesting that this argument, um, it's traditionally associated between um, a lot of these archaeologists today are associated with uh, Christian universities in the States, um, you know, who also are, are, are interested in maximalist positions, that the, the Bible is more useful as a historical document, as opposed to, and the other lot tend to be associated with this called the Stockholm School um, academics who are not so interested in saying that, or they're more, you know, they would say of themselves, we've got nothing against religion, it's just not history. Right, Israel Finkelstein, professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv University, dismissed Garfinkel's dating of the site as a product of methodological shortcomings in both fieldwork and interpretations. Right, the traditional view espoused by Garfinkel, the maximalist view, as I've been calling it, was based mainly on the biblical account of early history. And, you know, in other words, this is a unique and annoying case in which archaeologists compromise the evidence provided by their own discipline in favor of the one sided interpretation of the textual material provided by another discipline. You know, what's he saying there? He's saying you're meant to be an archaeologist. That means you dig stuff out of the ground and you treat it in its own terms. You don't dig stuff out of the ground, go running off to a different department, the department of Torah, and say, aha, you know, there's two gates here, there's two gates in the Torah, and therefore it's Shirayim. You know, and, and at this point, we're kind of in, you pay your money, you make your choice. You know, what have we said? There is no textual evidence of Abraham. There's no textual, sorry, there's no historical evidence of Abraham. There's no historical evidence of Moses. There's no historical evidence of Joshua at Jericho or any of those other kind of pre-king, um, you know, historical uh, stories that are recounted in the early part of Nevi'im, in Joshua, in Kings, in Samuel. But there clearly was a first temple. What do the minimalists think that the first temple was? Not a very impressive place. What do the maximalists think it was? Well, you know, you were a proper king, old David, old Saul, old Solomon. You know, they were properly in charge of a large space. They had lots of money. They put up a big building. And we don't know, but we can't find exactly which bit is first and which bit is second, because we're just assuming there's a whole bunch of rubble that was used for one was used for the other. It's all been moved around. It's just too difficult to find anymore. So you look elsewhere. So I'm just, I'm, so I've, I've lost Lachish. What happened to Leo? Sorry. Yeah. You, you look elsewhere. Um, you know, what other stuff have you got? You've got this place, Megiddo. You know, Megiddo is talked about in the Torah. And is Megiddo a sign that King David was already ruling and already powerful? And that's why there is a serious place with serious fortifications. And you can see it from the ground and you can see it from the sky and you can dig up stuff that shows the people were there. Is that proof that David was David or is it not? You know, if you're wandering through the rubble of the temple and you fell, do you like a maximalist go, aha, I know who wore golden bells on the edge of their, on the bottom of their, um, 
of their cloth. That's talked about in next week's Parsha Parshat Tzave of the garments of the high priest. Therefore, I think we have just found a golden bell that was worn by the high priest in Jerusalem and is officiating in the first temple, second temple possibly. Or do you just think that you've just found a bit of gold? If you dig out of the ground a buller, what is a buller? A buller is the, th the, the clay thing that has had a seal pressed into it, right? We don't have the seal that was pressed into it, but we do have the buller. We have, as it were, the, the negative of, 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 you know, what this seal was designed to prove. This is what Hebrew looked like in this period. And this says, Yush, sorry, I've lost my, there we go, Yushayahu. Oh my gosh, it's the name Isaiah. It's on a buller. And underneath it says, Ha, Nav, you know, um, uh, sorry, ha, 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 well, Hanav, Hanav, Hanav e, um, the uh, Nun Bet Yud, Navi. Now that sounds super exciting to me because Isaiah Hanavi sounds like Elijah the prophet. Oh my goodness, quoth the maximalist. We've just found the buller of Isaiah the Navi. I was just researching it yesterday and there was one website that was completely convinced that this is indeed you know isaiah's thing that said that you can see a finger mark on this clay we can feel the finger mark of isaiah the prophet the great isaiah but there's a just you know slow down says the minimalist slow down says the minimalist the minimalist would say so i'm just double checking my time here not my facebook messages um the, slow down it doesn't say hanavi in terms of the way that a prophet navi is spelt because it doesn't have the Aleph. For Navi as in a prophet is Nun Vet Yud Aleph. Now, no problem, says the maximalist. You can imagine that the Aleph was here and it's been worn away. So this yellow has been drawn in by this website that thinks this really is Isaiah the Navi. But it's not there. And actually, Navi Nun Bet Yud means the person who comes from Nob. And Nob really is a place. So it would be like saying, you know, the Londoner, or, you know, this is my little play. Um, this is Isaiah the prof. You know, if I was to say to you, it's Isaiah the prof, would you think that it was Professor Isaiah of, you know, 37 Gold Hest Terrace, or would you think that it was Isaiah the prophet? Um, you know, we don't have the et bit at the end of prof, you know, so, so that's the kind of argument that is going on. Um, it's not really going on inside the academy. You've really got the Hebrew University who are maximalists and kind of out on a limb themselves and basically everybody else who is being much more kind of classically academic, much more nitpicky about it. The only problem with the minimalist claim, which is that there is no historistic reliability in the Torah at all, up to the point when we start thinking there is, and I've got it, it's my last thing and I'm going to show you in a second, is something must have happened that brought us to the point where we now believe that the historical record and the Torah are actually talking about the same thing. You know, we do believe that by the time we get to the siege of Lachish, right, minus 701. So, um, you know, a little bit later to this real point of contention, the 10th, you know, minus 1000, minus 900, by the time you get to minus 700, we've got a ton of stuff that we can dovetail really, really neatly with the biblical account. In other words, you can take the biblical account in one hand and you can look at the archaeological remains in the other hand and the some of the other kind of stuff that we've dug out and you can go, my goodness, they're clearly talking about the same event. And now at this point, we know that we really do have historicity, history, a myth, like in a much more tight dialogue, we can actually look at the relationship between these two things. Like at this point, Lachish is a serious place. It's a defended place, and we'll see that in a second. And, and how did it get to be there? So what we can't do is we can't tell the beginning, but we know that when we first come into the story, there must be a beginning. So let me take you to the to Lachish. Uh, here it is, you know, sort of there. <laughs> you know, a little bit south of uh, Jerusalem, kind of level with Gaza and Hebron, maybe just a little bit north, um, you know, in this sort of, uh, you know, part of the uh, just you know south of Tel Aviv and places like that and you know we know that well we know where so we have textual evidence as how Lachish came to be part of the Israel the first commonwealth of Israel in the mind of the Torah because we've got it mentioned in Joshua chapter 10 Joshua passed from Lebanon and all of Israel to Lachish 
and he fought against and he fought against Lachish and God delivered Lachish to the hand of Israel. And from Lachish, Joshua passed on to Eglon, and Israel went with him, and they found him. In other words, it's part of this sort of succession of a narrative of a capturing of this sort of, you know, historic geographical swathe that becomes the first commonwealth, that becomes part of the story of, you know, of Saul and David and Solomon, but, you know, even back from the time of, of, of Joshua. And Lachish then kind of passes you know, passes the next couple of hundred years outside of the historical record. But, you know, if you take a, a helicopter, you can see that there was a settlement um, in this area. I'll, I'll explain in a, in, a, in a minute why we know that it's, um, well, we know, well, we know it's Lachish because we've dug up stuff that says, you know, hey, this is Lachish in this place. Um, and you can feel the kind of size of it. And you can feel that this is a, a you know, this is a, 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 a fortress. There is defences. There is um, a sense of, um, of it being a defence defended territory. And we can also see that there is a ramp that has been built up one of the sides in, into Lachish, which would have taken a bunch of doing. You know, somebody clearly decided that they wanted to take Lachish and they spent a while sticking a ramp up in order to do it. And here's the story from inside the biblical account. In other words, this is the story that we as Jews tell about Lachish in 2 Kings, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, boo, right? Sennacherib, big enemy of Israel from Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them all. In other words, this is the destruction of the northern kingdoms. He's coming in from the north, from the Tzafun, from the hidden place, and he is massively, massively powerful. If anybody saw the ex the um, the ex in the British Museum on Ash Bonapal, who was Sennacherib's father. I mean, it was an extraordinary exhibition. But um, here is here is Sennacherib, and Hezekiah, the king of Judah, sent to Sennacherib at Lachish, saying, I've done wrong, withdraw from me. Whatever you place upon me, I will bear. So Sennacherib is coming in from the north. He's coming in this way, and he gets as far as Lachish, and 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 uh, sorry, I forgot my king. Um, Hezekiah sends out a party to meet with him. I mean, you know, those of us who've watched Game of Thrones, or you know, like it, it feels like that. And 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 uh, and uh, Hezekiah's message is, I'm sorry, I was a little bit uppity. I should have acknowledged that you're the top dog. What do you want, right? And 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 the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, imposes upon Hezekiah, the king of Judah, three hundred talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. This is a ton of stuff. Sorry, I don't know precisely um, how much a talent is, but it's a proper weight. And what does Hezekiah does is he gives him all the silver that was in the temple and in the treasures of the king's house. He empties himself of anything that he has of value and gives it to Sennacherib to say, I'm sorry, I've been uppity. I shouldn't have messed you around. You, you know, I'm, it's like a dog rolling over and exposing its belly to a much more powerful dog. And at the time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of God and gave it and gave from the pillars which Hezekiah, the king of Judah, had overlaid, gave it all to the king of Syria. And when it came to pass, the king Hezekiah heard it. He tore his cloths and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of God. And he sent the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. I mean, in other words, we tell a story of Sennacherib turning up to Lachish powerfully. And Isaiah says to Amos, says, Thus said the God of Israel, that which you have prayed to me against Sennacherib of the king of Syria, I have heard. And this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning you. Tat, 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 tat. Um, skipping to the bottom. Therefore, thus said the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city, Jerusalem. He will not shoot an arrow against Jerusalem. He will not come before it with a shield. And he will not cast up a mound. And we know what a mound looks like. We've just seen one. Oh, sorry, why is this? Ah. Now, we have a couple of pieces of things which are interesting. One is, I think this is in the um, in the British Library, um, a prison of Snackrib. Yes, it's definitely in the British Library. It was definitely in this Ashbone, in the um, Ashbonopal exhibition. Um, 38 centimeters high. We have Snackrib's version of the story where you would not be surprised to hear that Snackrib thinks that he acted entirely reasonably but Hezekiah was such a jumped up idiot that I had to show him, you know, who's boss and I did. And I went down and I 
pushed a load of cities around and destroyed a bunch of them, including, says Sennacherib, I destroyed Lachish. As for Hezekiah, then Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities, uh, wall forts, countless small villages, and I conquered them by means of well-stamped ramps and battering rams combined with attack by foot soldiers. Oh, I've seen this ramp. My goodness, like this is starting to be kind of like, you know, genuinely exciting. I drove out 200, 200, 150 people, young and old, camel, female, daughters, you know, and Sennacherib, I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. And he had a turn for poetry. And now you've got the history of, of that we dug out the ground, the contemporary record of Sennacherib and the Torah kind of like in, in a sort of, in a sort of rhythm. Um, great question. I didn't see it just to answer that. I haven't got a good answer to that. And then we have this, this you know, and again, like, ugh, like, you know, who knows what's going to be handed back from the British Museum, but this is in the British Museum. I, I should have taken a picture of a human scale against this. Um, I, you know, a, a human body would probably come up from the floor about to this kind of height. So this is, this is significant work. And if you go to whatever it is, room 29 in the British, in the British Museum, um, it stretches across I don't know, like 40 feet of this room in this huge sort of eight feet tall bas relief of Sennacherib. I mean, you know, like I, I joked about it a couple of weeks ago. You know, there, there was a time when you went on holiday, you came back and you showed everybody your slides. You know, what Sennacherib did is he went out on a military campaign and he came back and he told the story of his campaign on the walls of his palace, on the walls of, 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 of his home. You know, oh gosh, Egyptians did the same thing. This is clearly something that you know is done, but here it is. It's the the uh, the siege on Lachish, and here is um, and the angle of this is 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 a true representation. In other words, this is a portrait of people making their way up the mound. Which mound? The mound that I know because I've seen it. Right, you know, up to Lachish and destroying it. Here, extraordinarily, the children of Israel are throwing down burning torches onto Sennach. Caribbean soldiers who are trying to storm Lachish. Here are a bunch of people dying. Um, narrative lines are slightly odd in the, you know, when you start looking at this kind of stuff, so you can't can't get too tied into sort of the narrative line. But here's a sort of, you know, here's a proper siege tower. We know what these things look like. You know, um, this is a picture based on that. You know, here are, you know, I'll use Sennacherib's words, my brave soldiers, you know, with their siege structures behind shields attacking Lachish. And here we have the, this, the, you know, we have the destruction of Lachish. And here we have the people of Lachish being taken and a BC, they're paying obeisance to King Sennacherib. And oh, if only I knew what Sennacherib looked like, but his face has been um uh I, I vandalized right you know people don't like people at some point so they they cut their face out but it you know here we have the historical record and the torah like you know maybe there's i mean you know, perhaps they're not saying precisely the same thing but they're pretty damn close and it's kind of extraordinary to be able to have these things in a kind of dialogue what do i think i've done um you know thank you for bearing with me and it's a privilege to be able to share this material with you I've looked at a series of moments in historical time from the earliest times when there is nothing that we can see that proves the Torah, but there are things that make us understand the world of the Torah, particularly the code of Hammurabi, which helps us understand the legal structures of the Torah in, in, in a much more rich way. We certainly don't have Anything that proves that the Egyptian narrative, right, that the Pesach story is a historistic account, but yet here we are. There is an argument about stuff that can be dug out of the ground in the uh, uh, eighth, ninth, sorry, in the tenth, eleventh, twelfth century BCE as to whether or not it proves the Bible as a historical account. And most people think that it doesn't. It's just stuff that we've dug out of the ground, as interesting as it might be, and it might help enrich our kind of like understanding of the milieu. But by the time we get into the um, the uh, the uh, tenth, ninth, eighth century BCE, you can really have fun holding things in one hand if you're allowed to break into these museums and lift things up out of their display cases and holding the Torah on the other side by seeing how there is a sort of like a historistic 
thing that can happen as you consider the Torah. What do we have to look forward to? <laughs> uh, next week, I'll be looking at uh, the ancient period. Um, I'm looking at um, uh, the, the period of the Romans. I'm looking at what does Israel do when it's not in control? Um, that will be the beginning of a whole journey through a kind of, you know, uh, a diasporic existence of our people. Um, that's next week. The following week, I'll be looking into the medieval period, and I'm going to move on to the modern period at the end of February, the last Tuesday of February. Um, I'm going to stick around a bit. I'll take any questions or thoughts, but um, I'm finishing on time. <laughs> 3,000 years for you. Um, you know, huge pleasure to be able to teach with you, and uh, thank you hugely for, for joining me this evening. Thanks very much, Jeremy. That was great. great. Thanks. Thanks.